Praise God. Good morning, church. How are we doing? Good. Welcome to uh, Townsville Worship Centre. Your expectation will be God's invitation to bring transformation. Are you ready for that? Amen. You ready to lift up the name of Jesus? Amen. Come on, let's just stand and join with the worship team this morning as we praise the Lord. God bless you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
praise. Give God the praise. Hallelujah. Sing it again. 
change today when I went down on my knees I asked the Lord have mercy please now he had compassion he showed me I found my Lord, it wasn't on the mountain, not in the valley, but it's not on my knees. I found my Lord, but it was on my knees. I found my Cha cha. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, this one I know everyone 
just follow um, Jennifer. You guys all know the song, but we sing it differently. Had a hard week. Come here, sanctify the Lord. Give God the praise. I love you, Lord, and lift my voice. Slow it down. To Yeah. 
We want your perfect timing, Lord God. We want your perfect time. We want the plans in our lives that you want, Lord God. We want you to order our steps, Lord God. We worship you and praise you. There is none other that we could follow, Lord, in your time, Lord God, in your perfect time. Follow the bouncing ball.
Thank you, Billy O. That's wonderful. But as you take communion this morning, just, just recognize who Jesus Christ is. If you're here this morning and maybe you've never accepted Christ into your life, this is a great moment to do that. As you receive these emblems, these emblems are going to be distributed. Pastor Christine's going to come and, and uh, share a communion message here this morning. God bless you. Where's Pastor Christine? Praise God. Here she is right here. Thank you, attendants. If you begin to distribute those emblems, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ. You are, most definitely. Well, I have typed this message out. This is the third time. I was back on it this morning and there's more alterations. So I was really blessed when Pastor Ross said, you do it and you do it again and again because that's what I do. The more time I spend with the Lord, the more I go, no, I don't need that, but I want that. The scripture I'm reading from this morning is 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 19. Verse 18 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you, from your forefathers. And verse 19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. I want to take two words from this portion of Scripture. Christ and lamb. In Exodus chapter 12, of the Old Testament, we see the sacrifice of lambs prior to the Israelites leaving Egypt. And in the New Testament, we see the Gospels speak of the sacrifice of Christ. Amazingly, the similarities in the two. 
Now, you all know that I'm a farm girl. I'm from the farm. I've said that before. So the lamb in the Old Testament, the lamb was to be man's best to God. Jesus Christ in the New Testament, God gave his best to mankind. We were to give our best, but he gave his best. It was to be the firstborn. The lamb was to be the firstborn. But Jesus was the firstborn. The lamb was to be a year old. Prime of life. Jesus was approximately 33 years old in the prime of life. He was to have no blemish or defect. That means the lamb, and this amazes me because I have worked with sheep. They were to be the best of the flock. They were to have no markings, no tags. And you know what? They would have still had their first, how do I call it, fleece of wool. Because you don't shear a lamb until it's 11 or 12 months old. So when it was presented as a sacrifice, it was as it was born. And do you know how hard it is to get a lamb that is perfect? You could have a thousand sheep and maybe only have 10 that are perfect. The other thing that astounds me, if they were not to have spot or blemish, you couldn't take their tails off. You couldn't mule them. You couldn't put an ear tag in. You couldn't earmark them because you would then put a spot or a blemish on that lamb. They could not have black spots or brown spots. You know, like if you have a flock of sheep, you will see all the defects. But Jesus, he's the only one that was absolutely perfect. The lamb, they would just give the best that they had or the best that they could buy. But Jesus was the perfect one. Absolutely perfect. In the Old Testament, the lamb was to bleed to death. I could go into all that side of it, but I won't. I'll spare you. But Jesus' blood was poured out for us. It was poured out for us, for you and for me, for every living soul. It was poured out. In the Old Testament, the blood of the lamb was to be painted on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over the Israelites' home. And it was used for many sacrifices. The blood of Jesus was shed for all mankind. You and I, he redeemed us, he bought us. And the other amazing thing was in the lambs that were told not to break any bones. And you know on the cross, Jesus, which was custom to have their legs broken, his legs were not broken. What an absolutely wonderful sacrifice. And the other thing I found, find amazing is that in the Old Testament, they were told to take a bunch of hyssop, which is used as a paintbrush to dip on and paint the blood around the door frame to stop the angel of death coming into the house. And you know, in John 19, 29, it says they put the sponge of vinegar on a stalk of hyssop. The similarities are just incredible. And you know, even still today, and you probably, some may know this, but the lamb's blood is used for humans, for antivenoms and antidotes. There's a big story behind that, but I'm not going to bore you with that this morning. But it is still used to this day. But we have the blood of one far greater. He is far greater running through our veins if we have accepted Jesus Christ. It was amazing that Pastor Ross said that this is the time, if you haven't accepted Jesus, this is the time to accept him. Jesus became the final sacrifice. He lived a blameless life and was innocent of all charges laid against him. And yet he was still killed anyway. 
for you and for me. I'm sorry if you think I'm too passionate about this, but I'm not. I love my Jesus. I love what he did for me. I know that I could not ever, ever do that. So in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, remember, we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He paid the ultimate price for you and for me. He paid it. If you don't understand that, then ask somebody. But you know what? The Holy Spirit will work on you and he will show you. Every time I think of this, my spirit just rises up. He came so that you could be healed. He came that you, so that you could be provided for. Everything that you have or want or need, he is there for you. Just before we partake, I'll share a little testimony. Last night when I was in this, till you know, late, as I do, I had an urgent message come through from Vanuatu. God is so good. I said, we have urgent prayer. The pastor said, my nephew is in extreme stomach pain. Can you please pray? I prayed. I agreed in prayer with him. And about half an hour, an hour later, I text back and I said, how's he going? He said, the pain has just stopped. See, that's what Jesus has done for you and for me, but we've got to take it. Take it from him. He's given it. So this morning, as you partake of these communion emblems, whatever your need is, present it to the Father. Present it to him and say, Jesus, I thank you for your blood that was shed for me. Amen. Father, I just thank you for this time, Father. Father, I pray that you would speak to each heart in this building this morning, Father. And Father, I just pray that they would... Come before you with humble hearts, Father. Any sin that has happened during the week, Father, they would just lift it to you this morning. Known sins, unknown sins, Father. May they present it before you this morning, Father. And as we partake together, that you would bless and honour each person in this room this morning. In Jesus' name. Let's partake. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Christine. This would be a great moment to pray. Various situations, various things around this room, if I was to ask you, there would be a, just a huge roar of things that you're praying for. I'm sure if you closed your eyes as I did this morning, I was up around three o'clock this morning, just out in the yard looking at the, at the beautiful sky covered with clouds and rain and stuff. But nevertheless, there I was praying and I was thinking of all the multitudes of prayer needs that I had around me and they seemed like, a, like an army was coming at me. It seemed like a demonic force was all around me. And then I heard the voice of the Lord say, lift up your eyes, Ross, into the hills from whence cometh your help. And as like Ezekiel said... To his servant, open, Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he might see that the armies of the Lord are far greater than the enemies. Amen. Amen. I want you this morning as we just pray. All of you have got requests. All of you have things that are happening right now. I want you perhaps to lift your eyes. Keep your eyes open. Often we close our eyes. I want you to lift your eyes. Look up into the ceiling. I want you to see beyond the ceiling. I want you to see the heavenly hosts that are around and about us. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen. Lord, we thank you that your armies are greater than any that we face. Any of the demonic hordes that want to come against us is greater. Whether it be sickness, sickness 
whether it be rebellion, whether it be disease, whether it be that stomach ache over in Vanuatu or, or over the other side of Australia, in this person, in these families, in loved ones that are here this morning, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over those things because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen. Glory to God. Give the Lord a shout and a praise offering. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God I'm in a Pentecostal prayer meeting. If I was in my Methodist old church, it'd be all be silence in the room. They'd be and they'd be looking at me and they go, oh, hey, praise God, praise God. You've got a number of things that are all happening. But you know, we're going to, first of all, we're going to take up our offering. That seemed like a good thing. That's part of our worship, amen. That's part of our worship. You know, the, the proverb writer would say, honor the Lord with your wealth and your barns will be free. You may not have barns, but I want to tell you, you've got wallets. Amen. <laughs> Kick the moths out of your wallets and start to fill them up, okay? The Lord gives you power to make wealth. He gives you the ability to budget. He doesn't give you the ability to be stupid with money. He gives you the ability to wisely use your money, but we are to honor Him first with our offerings. We talk about tithes and offerings. That's a good biblical word, tithes. It simply means we set aside a tenth of our income and give it. And many of you are giving online. Many of you are giving right now. I, Diane and I, we, we decide together what we're giving. And by, it's, it's gone in through my phone. Bang, done that. The offering bag comes by and the attendants look at me and they go, you're not putting any offering in, Ross. <laughs> then the bouncers come around and say, Ross, you're not getting out of here until you pay. A bit like over in Egypt, you'd, get the, you'd arrive at a place and all the tourists would get out of their bus and they'd jump on a camel and go for a ride. It was free to get on. It was $20 to get off. <laughs> and so it is. If you haven't paid your tithes and offerings, you'll be charged at the door. <clears throat> that same proverb writer, though, a few verses on after saying, honour the Lord with your finance, says, you know, when it's within your power to do good, then do so. Oh, I want to tell you, we're going, we're going to do some great things with, 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 with what we've got. Just before I just go on with that, though, you know, what I want to share is that there's, there's a whole lot of stuff happening in the church. And you've got these, everyone got one of these? Come on, guys. It's all at the front door. Okay, Abilio's done a wonderful job of printing these up, and it, this is fantastic for me because I I, I, I'm in church here and I don't hear what's set up the front here. Somebody's waffling along. Tony's talking, you know, Abilio's talking. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. Oh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> so I love to have that. So make sure you get that. It's got all your details of all the stuff that's happening. Now, one important thing, though, as I'm standing here is men's night on Friday night up in my shed. Shed happens at my place. All right. Shed happens at my place. Friday night. Now, bring your mates along. There's going to be motorbikes and mowers. Neville's going to be, I'm going to interview Neville, so it's going to be a real typical bloke's night. It's going to be incredible cuisine of, of barbecued sausages, maybe some onions, and if you're really good, we might have some mustard. That's, that's it, guys. If you're a vegetarian, please talk to me about it or bring your own stuff, okay? And there'll be some cold drinks there and bring five dollars. But bring your mates. It's going to be a good time. It's just going to be a couple of, you know, handful of blokes in my shed. Don't take any of your tools home with you. It's a Christian event, all right? And by the way, if you bring your own drinks, no Forex, no, vi 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 you know, no beer. It's no, 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 it's, you know, okay. I'll have some soft drinks there if you haven't brought some. But come along. That'll be a great night. All the details are in there. My address is in there. Just drive into the yard like you own the place and uh, we'll see you. We'll have, a, we'll have a bonfire going and all that sort of stuff. Be a good night. But I, said that before, I said before, the proverb writer said to, when it's within your power to do good, do so. Pastor Tony and Abilio are going over to the Ukraine in about a fortnight's time. Now, this is a war zone they're going into. People in there are hurting. <clears throat> Pastor <clears throat> Tony's going to just share a little bit in a few moments. But he's asked us if we would give a, some sort of contribution. And uh, Diane and I have prayed together and we've just put, a, put, some, put some cash in an envelope here that I'm going to ask Pastor Tony to come up and receive. This will just part. But please, you do the same thing. You don't have to do it in, a, in an envelope like this, but you can do it online if you like. But mark it for Ukraine so that Abilio, when he looks at the bank account and he sees you've put $10,000 in there and you've marked it for Ukraine, that he knows where to put it. Amen? Amen? 
Pastor Tony, come on up, receive this, and please just share with us just an update. We'll give him five minutes. That's five minutes over there, five minutes. You've got about ten. No, Pastor Tony. Praise God. God bless you, mate. Thank you. My father-in-law, Eunice's father, was a great man, and he would go to the business meetings at Richmond Temple, and they'd give very brief time for the members to ask any questions or make any statements or whatever. And we remember the time he raised his hand. He said, Mr. Chairman, could I have one minute, please? I promise not to take more than 10. (laughs) (laughs) We are going to Ukraine. We go into England first because we meet the leader of the ministry, the humanitarian ministry uh, into Ukraine. He got out in the first months of the war and probably that was good because had he stayed any longer, the Ukrainian government would have required him to stay and defend the country. But he felt that he got out in time, and he got out legally, of course. He didn't go undercover after they'd made that rule. And he felt that he could do more in being able to raise finance and superintend the money that came in. And I would, I would imagine hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars have come through his hands. He doesn't get one cent from them. He gave us a, um, an account number that has an Australian office in Melbourne and they too won't take one cent. So if you give $5, 10 dollars 50 100 2000 that's exactly what is remitted and it's done within eight minutes. So the money is sent from here And in eight minutes, it can be drawn upon in Ukraine. Quite phenomenal, isn't it? In days gone by when I was working for the Assemblies of God World Missions, the government of Ukraine used to take, at first, 25% of what you gave. And then they bumped it up. And we had to take the money in personally. And they must have got a a whiff of that. And the communist government and then even the changeover government, which was a bit of communism and a bit of democracy, how the two work, I'm not sure. I don't think it does. But when we got there, they used to ask us to not only declare how much money we were coming, which the Australian government does, you can't bring uh, take ten th- more than ten thousand dollars out. And we used to take ten thousand, but my friend Peter and I used to take five each. And when we got to Ukraine, they would say, "How much money have you got now? Put it on the counter. We want to count it." And uh, that was hilarious, really, because poor Peter. Um, has a problem with a trembling hand. Um, he has some disease, a motor disease. And so he'd take the money and it would be flying all over the counter, onto the floor, and, and all the people that wanted it the most would be drooling over it. In this last war that we have been into, not just last year, but Four or five years ago, we were there when we, they were shelling uh, probably as close as the Weir School is to us now. We drove down the road and I had said when we left, knowing we were going to Donetsk, I said to our driver and guide and interpreter, all in one, Nick, we're not going into a war zone, are we? And he said, oh, no, of course not. We were coming along and I got very suspicious when we had to go through three checkpoints, one after another. 
Then Abilio nudged me in the back of the car and we saw all the tank traps sticking out of the fields and we knew that we were in a bad area. And then we got to where we needed to be and no one was meeting in the church building. They were meeting in the garden and they were under one of the United Nations perspex uh, tents about how many? 60? 60 people crowned in. Billy O said there were 100 loaves of bread that Nick had brought and the people were starving for bread because they couldn't till the soil, couldn't harvest the crops because of these tank traps. And they didn't want to be exposed out in the open because they would be picked up off by the uh, snipers. So we were standing and worshipping the Lord and then when I was preaching or sharing, whatever the common word is, and giving the word of God, which those people were hungry, they never flinched when the bombs went off. And the artillery, the um, machine guns were flying around <laughs> with their bullets and here am I preaching and... <laughs> And I said, oh, Eunice, I loved you. I'm sorry, I can't say goodbye. <laughs> anyway, we survived, as you can see. Four weeks ago, in our, the safety and the serenity of our home, I rang my friend Arthur. Arthur was a very young boy that I met uh, in the Bible College in Kiev, and he was a young student. He was born in Armenia of Armenian and Russian parents and came to know Jesus. His mother came to know the Lord. I'm not sure about his dad. He died about more oh, eight years ago, I think. Artyom today is the manager of one of the hotels right in the centre of Kiev. And uh, I decided I'd ring him. I saw, you know, like us all, you have your little phone beside you. And I saw on Messenger that he was online. So I rang him. And it's a wonderful age that we can ring and be immediately in touch with people and we'll be that with our loved ones at home and you as well. And uh, anyway, I rang him and I could tell that he was, he's, he's quite a reserved person. So being reserved is not unusual, but he was particularly reserved. He was speaking in hushed tones. And I said to him, Arthur, where are you? He said, I'm in a bomb shelter. Right down, waiting for the bombs, waiting for the missile attacks. And that's in Kiev. So we know what we're going in. We're, we're not going to fly in because uh, you can't fly. You'd be shot out of the sky. So we're going by train and we'll be crisscrossing as we feel led and as we're directed. That's why we go to England to consult with Victor. Now, Victor is, if you met Victor, you would just absolutely love him. He and his wife, uh, wife Ruslana, she's a doctor, and they are living in Bournemouth, which is south, southern England, on the sea. And it's a, a place that has a huge population of Jewish uh, communities, mainly elderly, senior, wealthy people. And uh, we've been there many, many times for other reasons, not just this reason. And we will be staying at a Christian B&B uh, &B there that's owned by friends of ours. And uh, just down the road is where Victor and Ruslana live and their little girl and he will be consulting with us. He will be directing us. He will t tell us what to do, where to go and how to do it. And, and he will then have arranged for people to be waiting at the borders. And uh, we have no visas to Hungary or Poland, uh, which are the stepping stones and the gateways into Ukraine. We have no... Uh, visa into Ukraine. We didn't need one last year, so we're presuming we don't need one now. We're just going by faith. We are very, very um, confident that the Lord's in this because 
I have a word from the Lord that wherever I'll go, it will be a variation on the same theme. The scripture is, and I close with this, is found in Isaiah, and you're familiar with this, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings, good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. That's two different days. To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities. Hallelujah. So that's how the Lord has been speaking to me. And then it goes on to say, I think it's Abilio and me, along with a hundred or more others that go, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the son of the foreigner shall be your plowman and your vine dressers. So we feel we have a part in this great, wonderful opportunity. This will be my 37th trip into Ukraine since 1986. We came through Chernobyl. We were there that day for three days when that was billowing its radiation out all over the place. We were right there and came through unscathed. And our trust is in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Pastor Tony, I believe that you're going to be shining like you have never shone before. Good. You have shone through your life. Amen. That's pretty good. But I believe that God's going to just open up like a, like a pressure mantle in, in, a, in, a, in a light would just glow even brighter and brighter as the pressure is pumped up. So will the brightness come. Thank God bless you, you God brother. Bless you. God bless you. And thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, if you want to do good, if you send your power to do so, then think about how much you can offer and give in terms of funds and so forth for that to happen. Well, Abilio is going to share the word with us this morning. You excited about that? Oh, hang on. Look out. Look. She who must be obeyed has spoken. <laughs> Eunice is coming to the platform. I'm in fear and trembling right this very moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Lovely to see your smiling faces and those that are visiting. God bless you today. Wonderful to have you here. Now... A very special Golden Years event on Wednesday. It's John Burke's 90th birthday. Now, he has very poor health, so he's not always here, but we want to bless him. So I hope you can all come and bless uh, John on his 90th birthday and Carol too. Um, they're very brave with their health, but let's bless him and celebrate his birthday. So don't forget, Wednesday, 10 o'clock, bring a plate of food and we'll have a great time of rejoicing. It's wonderful to bless the saints, isn't it? Yes. In their older years. Amen. I know that too. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we've got some mandarins out there. So please take some, keep healthy, make some juice and rub it. Some there for you in the outreach. God bless you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Let's give a Billy a hand. Come on. God bless you, man. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Praise God. What a wonderful morning. I think I'm on. Lloyd's working there hard. Great. Well, what a wonderful choice of songs this morning. Um. I'm just going to share a few things uh, from the book of Ephesians. 
And, um, okay, I'll need that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so if you've got your Bibles there, please turn to Ephesians. And um, I've also got a small slide, if they could be put up on, on there as well. I find, I find the Word of God like a, um, a box with treasures in it. And within the box, there are other boxes with rarer treasures. And um, out of um, over 30 years of reading through the scriptures, um, there is stuff that I've read, reread, and then all of a sudden, there's a key that's been given that unlocks a box of further treasures. It's wonderful. And uh, I'm just um, reading through, through uh, the book of Ephesians. Um, I've, I've had that experience very much. And um, so not one particular passage that I'm going to be going through, but a whole lot of other pas- whole pa- uh, lots of passages. But the, the, the main thing I want to, to, uh, to just touch on is um, common phrases that come up in the book of Ephesians. Uh, I want to touch on the, the riches of God in salvation and uh, that are defined, uh, which gives certainty. Um, defining the old condition and the new condition. And then lastly, touching on the three prayers in Ephesians. And all these dovetail together and one is essential as the other. Thank you, Christine, for such a definitive um, proclamation around the... the um, Lord's table. We, we all know the gospel, don't we? We know that Christ died for us. He had to die for us because our, our Adam's race is, is sinful. We have all inherited that nature. But when we start to look at the way God saved us, what God did in Christ, and how God gives us his Holy Spirit to maintain that growth, is amazing. So just the three phrases that commonly uh, occur throughout this uh, book of only six chapters and six small chapters at at that, um, reading from from, uh, chapter one through to chapter six, it'll take anywhere from 20 minutes to half an hour, depending on how you pause and, and think about it. So it's not a big read. So to read it through a couple of times a day and, and just glean from it is quite doable. But the first reoccurring phrase is the in Christ, in him, in. So we can see all those scriptures over there. Just just in that one phrase, in Christ, in him, and and the the, uh, variance of that, 21 times. The second one is his, what is Christ, his will, his grace, his mercy, 23 times. And then throughout the book, six times it talks about Riches of his grace and rich in mercy. God's riches. All those things. Also, just to, um, I'd like to finish off uh, afterwards with a, um, a song that a lot of people, I guess, know of and heard of. Uh, it's a very simple chorus, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. And there's a reason behind that. But let's just have a look at the riches of God in salvation. And... Um, Turning to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 36. I'm just going to do a lot of scripture reading. Not a great lot of commentary. But, um, so starting at uh, chapter 1 and verse th- uh, verses 3 to 6. This is how it starts. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us acceptable in the beloved. 
So that's the work of God, the Father, in salvation. And then it goes on to chapter 1, verses 7 to 12. Wrong type of glasses. <laughs> okay, it says here, in, in him we have redemption. In whom? In, in Christ. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together all in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who, who works all things according uh, to the counsel of his will." that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. What a wonderful promise. That's the work of Christ in our salvation. It's very definitive, isn't it? And this is what I like about the book of Ephesians. It is definitive. It describes our salvation, what God's part is, what Christ's part is. Now we're looking at what the Spirit of God's part is. And verses 13, in him you were also trusted. We're having microphone difficulties. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Again, to the praise of his glory. Amen. Amen. And what does that ceiling look like? Because sometimes I, I ask myself questions. Do you do that when you're reading through the scriptures? You know? And sometimes you have to ask the right questions to get the right sort of answers. What does the ceiling of the Holy Spirit look like? What is that guarantee? What is the guarantee that the Spirit gives? I guess there's a key in that, a ceiling. What does a seal do? It puts an imprint on something. It puts an imprint. And that's the whole essence of this book, is that God, in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is putting an imprint of Christ into our lives. And how does that work out? I know one thing, that when I was saved, I didn't, when I wasn't saved, I didn't care how I behaved. I didn't care how I lived. I didn't care what I thought. But when I met Christ... All of a sudden, these things that I didn't care about, I began to think about. I began to think about my thought life. I began to think about my actions. I began to think about my words. So the very fact that we struggle against what we once used to do, don't be discouraged by it. Be encouraged by it because before you were saved, you didn't care. But now, this flesh is wrestling against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh that is the sealing of the holy spirit the fact that you don't want to do those things which you once used to do that's the thing that's wonderful isn't it i just like to turn into to uh, second peter um how is it evident uh, second peter uh, chapter one and verses four to eight just reading that scripture just to give you another another added look at what it is that the Spirit of God does. Because we see that God's choosing is done. Because he knows the end from the beginning. Okay, He doesn't say that this one will be saved and that one won't be. What he's doing through, throughout our lives and throughout humanity, he's, he's uh, arranging circumstances. And through circumstances, the Spirit of God is trying to change the disposition of the hearts of men and God knows when there's a only God knows he knows where there's a cutoff point where the person finally says I don't want God and that's when God as a gentleman backs away and we see it in Pharaoh 
you know, we see it in Pharaoh. It got to the point where he was seeing all these amazing, amazing, amazing signs. You know, the, the, um, the magicians of the day said, we can't do these. This is an act of God. At that point, Pharaoh could have said, it's an act of God. I need to do something about it. But no, he didn't. So God knows the hearts of men. So that's God's side. Christ's side, his death and resurrection is done. It's once for all. There's nothing that can be added, nothing that can be taken away. There's no works that we can do to add to it. The only thing that we can add to it is our obedience. But the work of the Spirit of God, the sealing process, is an ongoing process. The process that makes us like Christ. So going back to 2 Peter uh, 1, 4 to 8. Okay, reading from here. Have you got your Bibles? Great, okay then. So starting at verse 4, uh, actually I'll, I'll start at verse 3. And as his divine power has given us, has given to all, uh, uh, given to us all things that pertain to, the, pertain to life, godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. There's that word, the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lusts, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, and this is our part, giving all diligence to your faith, uh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what the Spirit of God helps us with. These things, what we should be doing, adding to our lives. It's very clear, isn't it? The Spirit of God leads us in these things. He gives us a list of things to do. This is what we yield to. So that covers the subject of the riches, riches of God in salvation that are defined, which are certainties. These are certainties in our lives. Defining the old condition and the new condition, as if that's not enough, what I've just read. He goes on to define what we once used to be and what we are now. Or sometimes you feel what we are in the process of becoming. Okay, uh, we'll go to uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians. Everyone got that? Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And this is the old condition defined. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once in conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. That's what we were, children of wrath, because we were under the judgment of God. That was our old condition. You can't argue about those points. But, but, the new condition... And just listen for those, some key, those key words, riches, his, in him, when I read these things. And that's found in, in chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ by grace you have been saved. What is it that we're saved by? 
grace, unmerited favor. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his grace in his kindness toward us in, in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's pause there. For by grace you have been saved. He's emphasizing the means of our salvation. It's by what Christ has done, unmerited favor. He died for us, not because he had to, because he wanted to. And it says, not of yourselves. And it even goes to say, this gift that we've been given is a gift of God. It's a gift from him. Remember that I was saying before that God is going throughout this whole world and trying to change the disposition disposition of human hearts I'm not just saying the Christian people or those that have a a, a propensity towards goodness I'm talking about 8 billion people on this earth he is working on their hearts he is trying to change the disposition of their hearts and once the disposition of the heart is changed or is at least Facing towards God, God then offers this gift of faith, this rare and precious gift, that it might be planted in a heart that's been prepared. That's what's happening here. It's a gift. Even as Christians, what have we done with this precious gift that God has given to us? Have we allowed it to take full root in our lives? How far do the roots of this seed of faith go into our lives? And I think it highlights it too. Also, you remember the parable of, um, you know, the, the, the talents. We all know, I think it's in a couple of the Gospels. I think it's in three of the Gospels. It's the king who gives the talents, correct? The king who gives the talents. The servants receive the talents. What do the servants do? They go out and trade. They go out and invest. Some some of the servants come back and they say, look what I have gained with that which you have given me. One servant hid it. And he said, here's what is yours. And the king was angry. He was angry for a reason because that which he gave him, he didn't multiply He didn't use. He didn't invest. There was no glory given back to that king. There was no gain. So we as Christians, as we have received this precious gift, let us invest this talent that we've been given to the glory of God. Okay, so this is the the new condition. This is the new condition. And it says that we shouldn't boast. This doesn't bring about boasting in our lives. This brings about humility. Another book which is tied in with these, with Ephesians is, is Philippians, Galatians, and they, they all seem to have this uh, connecting, connecting themes. And I find this humility which is found in the book of Ephesians where Christ came from heaven and humbled himself. There's that same, that's, that same humility. That's the same sort of disposition we should have, realising it's none of us and all of him. And then it goes on to say, For we are his workmanship. Again, that word, his. Everything in him and his. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepares our work. God has prepared our lives. This whole book of Ephesians is is a blueprint very much a blueprint for Christ-centered living. We heard, I think it was last week or the week before, Pastor Tony talking about the plans that God has for us and the plans that we have for ourselves. And then he said something which was very sobering. He said, in eternity, 
when God overlays his plans over your plans, or vice versa, your plans over his, will they match? Will they match? But God in his mercy says that he has prepared works for us to do, that we should walk in them. What an amazing thing. God has prepared all these. He's done everything for us. He has done everything for us. Uh, just in Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon, in his backslidden state, in his backslidden states, recognized the same thing, you know. God has made, given man his work to do. Even he, in his backslidden state, realized that God has given man work to do. And we, sometimes we think to to ourselves, you know, um, what I do is menial. What I do seems to be uh, not relevant to the gospel, not relevant to the things that, you know, pertain to God. But I say no, because God places us in different places, different works, for different times, and I've had it so so many times when um, over the last couple of years when I've when I've been working chopping and changing, I've had two jobs for, for uh, the first job was for like fifteen, no, oh, sorry, twelve years, and the next job was for ten years, which was Calvary at Cal, at Calvary, and then after that I had a spate of all these little jobs, you know, and some of them range from about a year, six months, two weeks, and stuff like that. And at that, t- at that particular time, I was thinking to myself, what am I doing? You know, I'm not working in a church. We were working for an organisation, uh, a Christian organisation. But there was all this secular employment that I had in between. And when I used to think those sorts of things, then in, in, a, particular, in a particular job, someone would either ask about the Lord and it would be them that would ask me. And I thought to myself, how would they know that I'm a Christian? And then at other times, it would be like um, in a conversation with a customer in a store. And out of the blue, they, they would say to me, they said to me, do you know someone by the name of such and such? And I said, yes, I do. And said, so, what prompted you to ask? And I said, they just said, oh, we just thought that you would know we're just travelling through, through Townsville and we'd like to reconnect with them because they led us to the Lord 20 years ago and we kind of lost our way. And that happened at every job. So I say to you, wherever you find yourself, walk in the will and the work of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So... Um, Okay, on to um, the next section in regards to the old and the new, contrasting the old and the new. And that's found in um, chapter 4 and verses 17 to 22. <clears throat> 17 to 22. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who once being who being past feeling have given themselves over to licentiousness to work all uncleanness in, with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. And this is where it gets into it. If indeed you have heard that, that um, sorry, let me start again. But if you have not, so, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts so he's just he's describing here these are the things that you ought to put off in your life we put off these things 
we recognize them in our lives because this is a long process, you know, as long as we're going to be alive, we're going to be going through this process, but it's to the glory of God. So we see these things and what does the scripture say? It says that we, we recognize these things and then we put them off. Okay, that garment's no good. Toss it off. Okay, I'm left without a garment. Okay, let's have a look at uh, the following verses, 23. So we've put off the old. We've recognized stuff that's no longer relevant to, to our life in Christ. We've put it off. And it goes on to say in verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which is created according to God in righteousness and in true holiness. Okay, now we put on the new which is created in Christ and in righteousness. So let this be a daily thing where you recognize things and in your mind you say, okay, that's no longer useful, put it off, no, no longer helpful. Okay, now what am I supposed to put on? And I think Pastor Tony would sort of like... Um, can, can identify with this because of his vast wardrobe. He has all these garments. <laughs> this is payback. <laughs> all these garments. <laughs> all these garments. And that is the same way with Christians. We have a wardrobe of rich garments to put on. Rich garments to put on. Know the riches that you have in Christ. Amen. Know that. The riches that we have in Christ. Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew 6.21, For where your treasure is, yes, yes, yes. there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? Are you finding the treasure in the word of God? Is your excitement, your expectation in going through the word of God and finding, as I described, another precious box, finding a key, opening it, and going through the wonderful treasures that are in that. The word of God that we have in these material pages, it's just material stuff, you know, just paper. But when it's activated by the spirit of God and it finds a lodging place within us, it changes. It transforms. And that is what God in Christ wants to showcase the world. Because it goes on to say that, you know, we are to grow into the, what stature? The full stature of Christ. The fullness of Christ. That's what God wants to showcase the world. Look at my children. See how I can transform someone who had no hope and give them hope, give them strength. This is what I can do in your life. That's what we're to be to this world. Otherwise, otherwise we would just be saved and we would be transported. Saved and transported, you know. That would be the, the logical thing, wouldn't it? But no, God wants to save us and transform us, not transport us. Transform us. Amen. Now, the three prayers. The three prayers. Starting in uh, chapter 1, going back to chapter 1 of Ephesians. And all throughout this book, Paul is trying to show the Ephesians, these are the riches that we have. These are the riches that we have. And he's wanting, and he's, he's praying for the Ephesians. And this is what he prays for them. In, verse, in uh, chapter 1, verses 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 
the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Pray this prayer that God would give you wisdom and understanding in all that he has done. That's one prayer. The next prayer is found in In chapter 3 and verses 14. Okay, has anyone got that? 3.14. It's a prayer for comprehension and realisation. Starting from verse 14, it says here, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height. What's he talking about that? to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. He's talking about that that love. The love of God has a dimension, has a a size. It has, has, you know, measurable things that you may know these dimensions of the love of God in Christ. And this is why I'm saying that this book defines things and how do, you do, how do you measure, how do you find out what the dimensions of the love of God is in Christ? We, we understand that the love of God sent Christ and Christ accepted willingly. It was almost as if who will go and save them? Christ said, yes, here I am. The love of God. That's one aspect of it. Okay, we can see that. That's kind of like a, a, a love that is set unchanging but how does it how do we take that and how do we apply it in our lives so the most logical thing to do is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 let's turn to that and verses 1 to 8 and first of all it starts off by saying what it's not And then it says what it is, talking about the love of God in Christ or love. Because, just as a sideline, the word love has been hijacked in our society throughout the Western world. Agreed? Agreed. There's no definition to what love is. You know, I love my dog, which I do. You know, I love hamburgers. Well, except for those that are from McDonald's. You know, we love things. You know, we love people. But the, the scriptures are very definitive on what love is. You know, philos, brotherly love. You know, sturgy, family love. And so on, agape, sacrificial love. So we need to define what this love of God is. So uh, first uh, uh, Corinthians 13 and starting from verse, verse 1, okay. Though I speak with the tongues of men and, and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass and clanging cymbal. Okay, that's one barrier of the love of God that we've a defining point. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding, all mysteries and all knowledge and thought, I have, and I have all faith, so that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. There's another demarcation of what the love of God is. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give and give my body to be, to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. 
there's another demarcation. What might look like love is not. Define that. Define it by the word of God. And then it goes on to say what the love of God is. How's it, how, do, how does it act? How do, you, how do you see it? How can you see it in action and say, yeah, that's, that's the love of God. I can see the love of God. And I can see the love of God in people here, in church. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. This is bringing out definition of the love of God. Does not behave rudely, does not speak its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, that is truth, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is the defining of the love of God. This is the measuring of the love of God, the, the height, the width, the breadth, the depth. Now coming to the third prayer, and Paul in chapter 6, oh, I better finish soon. Uh, Paul in chapter 6 of Ephesians Wrong way. Here we go. Chapter 6, 18 to 20. And this is a prayer that Paul asks for the believers to pray for him, but I think it's something that we also need to pray for one another and also for ourselves as well. It's a prayer for boldness, or boldness, I should say. And it starts here in verses 18. It says, and this is a carry-on from um, uh, Paul's discourse on on the, the armour of God. And it says here, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, now where is Paul writing this from? From a Roman prison. He's incarcerated and he's saying, please pray for me that I may speak boldly. And I could imagine all sorts of thoughts that he'd be experiencing. I don't want to add to my suffering. I don't want to add to my incarceration by proclaiming stuff that will be antagonizing my captors and sometimes that's our society I don't want to share the gospel or talk of Jesus because people might get aggravated you know things like that and and even even more so in in our workplaces nowadays because God is not wanted you know God is not you know he doesn't want to he's not wanted by people in the workplace so we as christians must be praying god make me bold make me wise and give me opportunities to share so that's basically what i have to share it's it's finding our riches in christ not in anything else it's being definitive in our faith. It's applying the very clear principles of how to abide in that, how to abide in Christ, how to grow into the image of Christ. This is what we need. This is what we're called for. This is the will of God, our sanctification. 
And I know I've talked about the sanctification the last time I spoke, but I just see it's so important. It's important for us and it's important for God because he wants people that reflect his glory. He wants, he wants Christians to be like Christ. And I've, as you can, I guess everybody has had this experience. You either get one of two people. You, got, you get people that are attracted by that and you get people that become antagonistic and angry because they see what they hate. They hate God and they see God in you and they hate it. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing because you know that you're living in Christ and at least your life is a witness to those that are darkened or to those that are searching for light and searching for life. This song, um, just a very, very, very simple song. And um, I think a lot of people know it. It's, it's um, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. And in, in that, everybody knows that particular one. But there's a, a verse, one single verse, which kind of gives clarity to what it, and also a bit of depth. It says, it says who, can, who, can, who can weigh the value of knowing you? It's a question. Who can know the, the, the value of, of knowing you? Who can judge the worth of who you are? Who can count the blessing of loving you? And when I think of, you know, jewelry and, and precious things, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people think, okay, it's a beautiful piece of jewelry, you know, and... Um, it's lovely, you know, it, the, the stone, the diamond, the ruby, all of these things, the, the cut, they're, they're beautiful things. You know, they're, they're things that are desirable. Um, I, I don't wear much jewellery. I, you know, never sort of like been attracted by it. But, but I, can, I can say they're, they're beautiful things. Yeah, <laughs> too poor. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, um, and sometimes we don't actually think, we look, we look at the beauty and we think, yeah, that's, that's a lovely piece of jewellery, you know. You know, uh, I love the colour of gold. I love looking at diamonds. You know, I love the way they sparkle. But rarely do we think of the effort that it took to mine these things. I mean, just think of the, the millions of tonnes of, of rock and soil and things like that that, that has been moved to, to extract gold or silver or diamonds. You know, humanity has moved mountains of things to extract these precious minerals. And God is in the moving business too, as I mentioned. God wants to move 8 billion hearts towards him. 8 billion hearts. Well, if you'd just like to close your eyes, and we're just going to... We're just going to take this, this song Hopefully the microphone's on. and um, we're just going to make it a prayer. If you want to sing along softly. Oh, it's not the wrong guitar. So if you just want to... Eyes closed and of all the things that we desire, all the things that we desire, just think of the, of what we just heard this morning from the book of Ephesians, all the treasures that we have in Christ.
Sí. So, Lord, we just come to you this day. Father, we just ask you that um, in all things, that, Lord, you would be our treasure. You would be our riches. Father, we know that one day we will walk on a, in a city of streets of gold, a pavement of crystal, a city with foundations of precious stones, and Lord, we just want to recognize those riches here in this world that we may shine for you, yes. that we may share these riches with those that are longing for light and life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor Ross. Thank you. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. You're all awake now. <laughs> Turn to somebody and smile and say, Jesus loves you. Praise God. You know, the one thing I took out of that there, right there, you know, many times we can stand up here and preach and so forth, and I heard Abilio say, you know, we need to bloom where we're planted. Learn to, learn to, learn to know, be content in where we are. To say, Lord, here I am right now. This is the season in my life. This is, the, this is the, where I'm at right now. How can I shine my very best where I am right now? Amen? Whether you're in the, in the workforce or you're retired, like I'm retired, just sit back at nothing to do all day. It's funny when you're retired. Oh, I can't do that Friday. I'm mowing the lawn. Oh, Wednesday. No, no, no. We're going shopping. You know, oh, no, no, Thursday's out. No, 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 no. I play table tennis for an hour. <laughs> Praise God. But let's bloom where we're planted. Amen. Take that home with you today. Lord, we are, we are your diamonds. We are your gold. We're shining for you. And let us be that glory that shines forth every day. Amen. Amen. God bless you all, saints. Have a wonderful day. Let's stick around for a cup of tea and coffee. This is where church really...